Hello, my name is Frayne Olson. I'm the Crop Economist and Marketing Specialist with NDSU Extension. I'm going to provide a brief update on the dry edible bean market, focusing specifically on pinto beans and navy beans. Um, as most of you know, it's very difficult to get public information about what's happening in the dry bean market. So uh, this presentation is really a combination of some USDA data, uh, some information gathered by uh, subscriptions that I have for uh, some dry bean marketing people, as well as discussions with folks from the industry. So this is kind of a compilation or a, a blending of all of that information. So once again, I'm Frank Olson. This is uh, my title side. As you can see, I have some contact information there. So if you do have questions later on, feel free to contact me, or you can contact your local uh, extension agent. Um, and they can certainly uh, forward your information to me and I will do my best to respond and answer. So I'm going to start out with the pinto bean market and uh, provide a, a, a review and an update on what's happening there. So first, uh, just cut, let's take a step back in time, look at planted acres. As most of you know, the North Dakota is one of the largest pinto bean producing regions in the country. Uh, when we look at planted acreage, the gold bar is North Dakota planted acres. Uh, and then the, the green bar is other areas or other states. We do finally have some information on total production. Um, it, it, it takes a while to compile that in the January USDA production report. We do get information for a dry bean production by class, by state. So when we look at total pounds or hundred weight produced, uh, well, you can see that that nationally, this was a it wasn't a record year, but it was very close to a record year. If we look at North Dakota production specifically, this was a record year when you look at total pounds produced. So 2021, uh, 2020, that production year was the largest production for North Dakota at 9.1 million pounds. Uh, the second largest was back in 2017 at about 8.4 million million pounds. Now, given the size of the crop, there are some traders that are questioning the USDA production numbers because they the, the sense is, well, it seems like supplies are a bit tight relative to, again, that size of a crop. And, and we're starting to find out that there was actually some more frost damage than we first expected. Uh, so if you guys remember, we had in late September, first part of October, we did have some frost hit uh, the growing region. Um, and, and again, most of the crop was, was mature at that point, but there were some areas that did have some frost damage. Uh, when, when we run into combines over the fields, we didn't really see that, the, at least the extent of the damage. But now as it's been in storage for a while, we start pulling it back out of storage. We're starting to see that there was actually a little bit more damage than we first expected. And, and I do think that that is part of the reason that we are, there's this sense in the marketplace that supplies, and in particular supplies of number one beans, are a bit shorter than we had expected. So when we look at grading and classifications, you have a number one bean and number two bean, which is the most common uh, you know, um, into marketed into the, the, the uh, marketing system. Um, we can clean out the frozen beans, but it is uh, somewhat expensive because you have to use an electric eye system. And what ends up happening is the volumes actually drop because you do the clean out, right? So for those beans that are that are frozen, we get to clean those out. Um, so the total volume of number one beans or those higher quality beans is actually a bit tighter than we first expected, given the size of the numbers that came out of USDA production. When we look nationally, um, even though this was a very large crop nationally, it was not a record. Uh, it was uh, nationally 13.4 million pounds uh, relative to the, to the largest number, which was actually back in 1981 at 14.5. So what does this mean now? We have a, a better read on what the production numbers, what does that mean on the consumption side? Just as a reference point, about 75% of the pinot beans we use is for domestic consumption about 25% approximately hits the, the uh, export market. Now, usually the domestic use is relatively stable. Um, you know, it, we don't see a huge variation from year to year in, in total domestic consumption. However, COVID-19 has uh, adjusted those supply chains and we have starting to see some, some changes now. We saw it earlier on in the season. Um, this is now extending into uh, the 2021 marketing year as, as, as COVID-19 continues. What we have seen is a reduction in the restaurant consumption. So those 
Beans that typically go into the food service sector, into the restaurant sector, have, have dropped up relatively quickly because of, again, the, the limited seating in a lot of the restaurants. With the exception of drive through so those restaurants that offer some drive through service, and in particular specialize in some of those dry bean products, have seen actually an increase. So we're seeing a shifting in where people are buying the restaurant food. Uh, we've also seen a pretty large increase in the canned and consumer ready bag products. So one of the things we saw right around harvest was this pretty dramatic shift. A lot of the beans now going into canned products. Again, people concerned that they were gonna, uh, if they were going to get sick and or had to quarantine, they really didn't wanna go out shopping. Uh, canned bean products were just a really nice thing to have on, this, on the shelf in case you were feeling sick or, and or you had to quarantine. Now, when we look at the export market, the two dominant export uh, destinations is Mexico and Dominican Republic. Um, and again, about 25% of all of our beans are exported with Mexico and Dominican Republic being those two export destinations. Now, I was earlier concerned about what COVID-19 and economic recession would mean for sales into both of those countries. Uh, but it seems as though vo trading volumes have been relatively strong. Uh, I, and, and part of the reason or rationale given for that is that there's this return to more traditional or comfort meals. Um, again, if we're sp spending more time at home, uh, cooking and home, preparing more home meals, uh, from an ethnic standpoint, dry beans, in particular pinot beans, is a, a significant portion of that diet. Again, I've also been a little bit concerned about fluctu fluctuating um, currency rates, in particular between the United States and Mexico, but it does seem as though that is now stabilized and, and isn't really a, a major factor in our trade or trade flows. Just graphically to try and put some context behind this, if you look at the two largest, again, Mexico, Dominican Republic, and closely followed by Haiti as, as the number three destination, uh, Mexico, Dominican Republic usually accounts for between 60 and 70% of our total export demand. And it has fluctuated from year to year, depending upon what's going on. What do we see this year now? Um, there had been rumors earlier on that Mexico may be returning into the US market to try and buy some larger quantities. It seems as though that now is starting to happen. There's some concerns about the size of the Mexican crop. Again, it's a, the, the early reports are that this, it, it's going to be an okay crop, but not a fantastic one. So that is opening the door now, given it seems as though some increased demand base in Mexico that, that has opened the door for some ad additional export sales from the U.S. into the Mexican market. What that exact size looks like um, is, is still open for debate. And it is kind of a hotly debated topic right now is just how big is that Mexican demand base. And, and usually what happens, again, very difficult to get good trade information about what's happening. I do wanna shift gears a little bit into what's also happening in the 2021 uh, contracting season. Uh, we're now moving into that and there, this, this battle for acres is back. Um, the corn and soybean market has recovered pretty significantly in the last several months. Uh, export sales in those, those markets have been very, very strong. We're seeing some very large uh, expectations for a shift away from our traditional crops and into more corn and soybeans, in particular in this northern growing region. So the, the contracting market, so the, the local bean dealer that's trying to play that in-between game between uh, domestic consumers or domestic users as well as the international market and as well as contract then back with the farmer is really having a struggle right now. On, on trying to identify what is that price? At what point would farmers be willing to contract some more acres? Um, and it really is a moving target. So this is one of those, you're feeling around in the dark, trying to figure out where we need to be. Given the current strong demand base, the industry can't lose too many acres. We can see a little bit of slippage. Last year, we had a big increase or surge in pinot bean acres, as you saw in the graphics earlier. We can't afford to lose a few of those acres because of the large 2020 production, but we can't see a large slippage. Again, just because that demand base is there, there is interest in not only 2020 old crop beans, but also some new crop beans. 
The big wild card, of course, is what's going on in the oil seed market, particularly in both soybeans as well as canola. And again, those industries, those sectors are trying very hard to increase or buy more acres. Ending stocks for both soybean and canola are pro projected to be very tight. So the question then becomes is what price do pinto beans need to be at? What kind of contract price do we have to have to be able to hold those acres? Um, now, the timing of what's going on in the corn and soybean market is relatively uncommon. We usually don't see big price rallies coming into effect after harvest, but that's essentially what's happened now. And so the, the industries that do a lot of contracting are now struggling to try and say, well, how do we, how do we maintain our acreage base? One of the things I do want to caution uh, you as producers to be thinking about is that that price spread between old crop and new crop oil seeds, both the pinot beans and, and um, canola, I mean, excuse me, the soybean and the canola acreage, uh, there's quite a price spread. And in particular in soybeans, we're seeing a pretty strong inverted market, which means the prices for nearby soybeans are much, much higher than they are for uh, the distance the soybean uh, delivered into the future. And so we're already looking at about a $2.20 price differential between old crop and new crop soybeans. So when you guys are trying to make the decision about what to plant and how many acres to plant, make sure that you're looking at new crop bids, not necessarily the old crop prices. So as you look at what's happening in old crop pinot beans, we are seeing the uh, price recovery. The red line in, in the middle of this graphic is uh, the kind of the average price for this North Dakota, Minnesota growing region. Uh, typically, we do not see major price recovery or price rallies as we move into this winter month, uh, winter time period. Typically, we see a very flat pinot bean market. I know in some of my previous uh, discussions, that was my expectation. But given the dynamics that are currently going on in the marketplace, some demand base in the old crop, as well as some concerns about new crop acreage, um, I do think we're going to see some price volatility as we move into these winter months, and in particular, in, as we move into the spring planting season. So just be watching and paying attention very closely for those that haven't sold their old crop pinot beans. Shifting in navy bean, we have some similar dynamics, but a little bit different case. In navy beans, uh, again, we did see quite a, a rebound or recovery in planted acreage, uh, both in this North Dakota, Minnesota growing region, but also in other states, in particular in Michigan. We saw a pretty healthy rebound in, in Michigan acres this year. When we look at total navy bean production nationwide, this is a good year by for sure, uh, but again, not the record levels that we saw in the pinto bean market. And when we look at the split between what was grown in North Dakota and what's grown outside of this production region, we see that most of that increase was outside of the production, out, outside of this northern growing region. Navy beans, uh, a little bit more evenly split between domestic consumption and exports, domestic making about 50, 55 percent, and then the remainder being the export market. Again, very similar to the to pinot beans in the sense that domestic market historically is very stable. Uh, we have seen some shifting of supply chains where the navy beans are being shipped because of COVID-19. Now, we don't see as much drive-through traffic for navy bean products at the consumer level. Uh, a lot of the consumer level navy bean uh, consumption is through the traditional restaurant chain. But just like in the pinot bean example, we're seeing a large increase in the demand base for canned or consumer ready product mainly moved through the uh, store shelves at the grocery store, not necessarily through the restaurant trains, chains. One of the big unanswered questions that I had going into this, this marketing year for navies was what's going to happen with uh, the UK, United Kingdom. So UK, England, Britain, uh, as well as Italy tend to be the largest export destinations for US Navy beans. Now, Europe has been hit a lot harder economically as well as from an from a, a infection standpoint by COVID-19 than in the U.S. has. So, again, a lot of questions about what does that mean for demand base. It looks as though, very similar to the U.S., that the Europeans are doing, the European consumers are responding similarly. There's a lot of interest in canned product as well as, as product that's, ready, that's uh, more in a ready-to-eat form. 
Brexit, which was the, where the Britain was exiting the European Union, um, still has some, it, the, the agreement has been signed, but there's still some implications. We don't know how this is all going to play out. Uh, Britain has been part of the European Union since the 1950s. And so this separation and how trade flows will happen between the, uh, Britain and the rest of the European Union are still being worked out. Even though an agreement is placed, there, there's still a lot of uncertainty on how these trade flows are actually going to work. When we look at just as a refresher, when we look at where do Navy bean exports, where do we, where do we export those? Uh, again, just a, a visual comparison, Euro European Union or the, the, excuse me, the United Kingdom, Britain, um, and Italy tend to be the largest export destinations. The trade flows between the United States and Canada have shifted a little bit over the last couple of years because of some trade issues. Uh, but you'll notice the United Kingdom, UK, notice the drop we had in 2019 and 20. A lot of that was because of some export tariffs that were placed on. We're now seeing a rebound or recovery in those exports. So the 25% tariff on navy beans, great northerns, and kidneys into the European Union, as well as Britain, are still in effect. Now, that 25% import tariff is putting some limitations on U.S. navy beans into the continental Europe, but not necessarily impacting navy bean flows into Britain or the U.K., and that has been, again, a little bit of a surprise. Um, it looks as though the demand base into the UK, now that they have separated from the European Union, is actually stronger than expected. So despite these import tariffs still being there, those exports have been relatively strong. Very similar to Pinot's, the navy bean market is also starting to see that uh, the frost damage, in particular as we start pulling some of those navies out of storage, was actually a little bit stronger, a little bit higher than we had first expected. Just like the Navy bean market, yes, we can clean them. We can run them through a separator or an electric eye to clean that out. But again, the available supplies of that number one grade or the high-end um, Navy beans are, are a bit tighter supplies than we had first expected, even though production was reasonably good. The other thing that's happening is seed supplies, in particular for certain varieties, are also in tight supply. Not that we're going to, it's really going to limit the ability to, to uh, adjust acreage, but you may not get the varieties, specific varieties that you're looking for. So please pay attention to that. The other final comment, I guess, on the Navy bean market is these multi-year contracts that the Navy bean industry has shifted to does really help stabilize not only prices, but also stabilize acreage shifts from year to year. So even though higher soybean and, and higher uh, canola prices are potentially impacting the market. These multi-year contracts, again, uh, stabilize those shifts. Very similar to navy bean, uh, pinto beans, we are seeing navy bean prices uh, for old crop beans recover some. Again, usually during this time of year, we don't see that occurring. So do pay attention. Um, again, the surprise was not only a little bit slower, lower stocks, high quality stocks because of frozen beans, but uh, the, a bit of a surprise to the market was the demand base coming out of the UK, out of Britain specifically. So thank you for your time and attention. Hopefully you found this valuable. Once again, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me or to your county agent, and I'll do my best to respond. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.